Okay, I think we'll get going. So welcome everybody to today's Queen's Policy Talks webinar. My name is Maddie McKay and I will be co-moderating this discussion with Hannah Simpson. We are both graduate students at the Queen's School of Policy Studies in the Masters of Public Administration program. Before we begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's is situated on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and study on these lands. I encourage you, wherever you are, to reflect on the territory you are on today. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to mention if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature that is found at the lower middle of your screen and you're able to do this anytime throughout the presentation. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jane Philpott. Jane is the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences here at Queen's University and the CEO of the Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization. She is a medical doctor and a former member of par Parliament. Prior to politics, Jane was a family doctor um, for 30 years and spent the first decade of her career in West Africa. She was the Chief of Family Medicine at Mark Markham Stouffville Hospital and Associate Professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. From 2015 to 2019, she served as the Federal Minister of Health, Minister of Indigenous Services, President of the Treasury Board, and the Minister of Digital Government. She has recently been appointed as the Minister's Special Advisor for the Ontario Health Data Platform. Her talk today is titled, Do We Still Need the Canada Health Act? So without further ado, thank you very much, Jane, for sharing your time and experience with us today. And I'll hand the floor over to you and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, Maddie. Really uh, great to be here. Thank you to both Maddie and Hannah for co-moderating the, the session today. And a big thanks to the Queen's School of Policy Studies for the invitation to do a policy talks seminar. Uh, and I'm delighted that so many of you have decided to join us today on a topic that uh, I hope is of interest to many of you related to the Canada Health Act. And I was saying to Maddie and Hannah before uh, we got things started that it, it's a bit of a, a, a niche policy geek topic that there are uh, a bunch of people across the country that find really, really interesting and other people might not find it interesting at all. But I hope that over the time that we spend together that uh, you'll find uh, something to grab hold of that will uh, cause you to reflect a little bit on the Canada Health Act. And certainly I look forward to your questions as we go forward forward. Um, I was given pretty much free reign in terms of picking a, a, a topic for this talk, something in the health policy field. And so I, what I would like to do over the next number of minutes is give you a bit of a look behind the scenes, something that you don't often, uh, as health policy uh, geeks, as I may call you affectionately, uh, you don't often get to see what it's like behind the scenes in the office of the Minister of Health. Uh, as you all know, probably the Federal Minister of Health is responsible for upholding and enforcing the Canada Health Act. And uh, as the title of the presentation indicates, I'm hoping that the stories that I tell you will give you a little bit of a lens on the question of whether we still need the Canada Health Act. Uh, and I will also just in, in uh, preface uh, tell you that I gave a fairly similar talk to this uh, about a year ago, just pre-pandemic uh, at the Center for Health Services Policy Research in, at UBC. So if you happen to have been in the, in the audience at that event, you'll, you'll find some uh, significant similarities, but uh, hopefully uh, not too many of you were there. So let me go back a bit and I'm going to go back as far as November the 4th, 2015. And I was in the unique position then to become the Minister of Health for Canada. Uh, I was actually the first doctor, uh, medical doctor to hold that exact position. Uh, if one wants to be completely technical, uh, we should note that there were two previous physicians who held a similar position, although it had a different name at the time. There was a Dr. Jane James King for a couple of years and a Dr. Donald Sutherland for one year uh, who were both medical doctors and they were each uh, ministers of pensions and national health in the 1920s and the 1930s. So it had been a very long time since there had been somebody with that kind of background in that portfolio. Uh, 
But as you might imagine, having a health background uh, came with some significant advantages in that role. And one of them was that I knew something about the Canada Health Act. I had uh, studied it uh, and served under it as a doctor. I was guided by its principles. And uh, to lay my cards on the table early on, I was convinced beyond a shadow of uh, of a doubt that part of the success of Canada's health systems relies on maintaining the foundational principles of the act, in particular things like access to care based on need and not based on the ability or willingness to pay. I think the Canada Health Act is an exceptional piece of legislation and I will forever be grateful to the very smart and caring people that brought it into law in 1984, the year I graduated from medical school. Uh, As you, many of you will recall, Monique Bégin was Federal Minister of Health at that time. And for those of you who haven't read her memoirs, I really encourage you to to get a hold of the delightful memoir by Monique Bégin written, it's called Ladies Upstairs. Uh, And it uh, has a a chapter or two particularly devoted to the establishment of the Canada Health Act. And um, I've had the privilege of having some wonderful conversations with Monique Bégin about what that was like. But I have to say, when I read her book, I was a little bit embarrassed because I realized that all of this stuff was happening while I was a medical student. And I really wasn't particularly aware in the early 1980s of the chaos uh, that was unraveling Canada's uh, unique health healthcare landscape. It really was the Wild West uh, in the early 80s, the Wild West of extra billing and user fees. Somehow I must have been focused entirely on things like studying anatomy and pharmacology and I wasn't actually paying much attention, I don't think, to federal provincial health policy debates. Um, Although there was kind of this awareness at some level that there was a constant threat of doctor strikes as we got closer and closer to 1984. In some ways, it's actually a miracle uh, that the Canada Health Act passed as it did. Um, It passed with all party support. It had a very strong network of advocates. And I must give a shout out to the nurses because it was really organized nursing that was probably the strongest force of advocacy and the bill was passed. And because of that, I will say that Monique Bégin is always going to be a Canadian hero in my eyes. So let's fast forward to 2015 and I became the health minister. And again, uh, at 2015, the Canada Health Act was under threat in a number of ways. And by that time, I understood much more about what the serious implications were of that. And I felt personally, amongst a bunch of other things that were super interesting at that time, I felt a huge burden that under my tenure that act would be administered in its fullness and that it wouldn't be weakened through either ignorance or neglect whether willful or otherwise it's my sense that in general and i'm happy to hear this argued but i don't think most canadians pay much attention to the canada health act and i actually would suggest that maybe most politicians are happy to keep it that way Uh, But you may be interested in hearing that whether you heard about it or not, under my tenure uh, as Minister of Health, there was a lot of discussion of the Canada Health Act in the office of the minister. And some of that discussion, of course, I'm not at liberty to give full details on, but I can tell you quite a bit, mostly because a lot of it's already in the public domain if you know where to look, and I'll fill in a few lesser known facts. So I think the great beauty of the Canada Health Act lies in its simplicity. As you probably know, it lays down the criteria and the conditions for how health services have to be provided by the provinces in order that a full Canada health transfer may be made. And uh, hopefully all of you health policy students can rhyme off the four, five criteria uh, in your sleep. Uh, The five criteria that have to be met by the provinces are public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, portability, and accessibility. So that part's pretty straightforward. And the other piece, the enforcement mechanism is also in theory quite simple, and it really just has two parts. So the first is that if the federal government is of the opinion that the healthcare insurance plan of a province or territory doesn't satisfy one of those criteria, then the federal government can impose discretionary penalties 
and reduce the Canada Health Transfer to a province by an amount deemed appropriate given the gravity of the default. But it may surprise you to know that to date, those discretionary penalties have never been applied. But the second piece is that on specific violations of extra billing or user fees, the penalties are mandatory and automatic according to the act. And it specifies that the deduction from the Canada Health Transfer has to be equivalent dollar for dollar to the amount of extra billing and user fees. Thankfully, the minister is not on his or her own to determine whether there have been any breaches. There is a part of Health Canada, perhaps a little known part, but uh, those of you who are perhaps spending time uh, plus, uh, doing co-ops with Health Canada this summer, um, you might have a chance to work in what's called the Canada Health Act Division, affectionately known as CHAD. Uh, and their responsibilities include monitoring the provincial and territorial compliance with the requirements of the act. And they, that department informs the federal minister of any possible non-compliance and they recommend potential action to resolve it. So here's where things get a little bit tricky. The monitoring is not actually as easy as you might think. And it relies on this division, Chad, scanning the media, following up on correspondence or public complaints, they follow up with provinces and territories as issues arise and they try to resolve them behind the scenes before there is a necessity to make deductions. But unfortunately, uh, Canada, Health Canada Act has no authority under the act to investigate directly. It's the role of the provinces to do the investigation. So what happens is that each province or territory is expected to provide financial statements every December to Health Canada and they itemize any extra billing or user charges that have been discovered or reported and state whether those amounts have been reimbursed to patients. If nothing is received from a particular province and territory and or the minister has reason to believe that the information that was provided by the province or territory, that's listen to that carefully. If the minister has reason to believe that the information provided is incomplete or inaccurate, then the minister is actually expected to estimate a potential deduction, uh, but is required to consult with the province or territory before doing so. So hopefully you're with me still. So right from the start of my mandate as Minister of Health, I knew that non-compliance with the act was an issue I'd have to take on. Of course, uh, at the time, the public face of the government priorities as it pertained to health in 2015 included things like negotiating a new health accord, uh, working under pressure to develop uh, the first legislation on medical assistance in dying. Uh, but behind the scenes, there were a lot of conversations with my deputy, with senior public officials and the minister's office regarding the matter of non-compliance with the act, uh, particularly in a few provinces, BC, Saskatchewan and Quebec. And so right from the start, I began signaling in speeches and in meetings with my provincial and territorial colleagues, my firm commitment to enforcing the act. I had good reason to believe that the magnitude of non-compliance, particularly in BC and Quebec, was much greater than the amounts that they were reporting each year. And I was determined under my tenure that we wouldn't turn a blind eye to these matters. Among other reasons, I knew at the time that there was a case in the Supreme Court of BC that was going to be affected by how seriously our federal government uh, took its obligations under the act. And so one of my first actions on the file was to speak to the federal attorney general about the need for the government to seek intervener status in the BC case. And I am happy to report that the attorney general, who at the time was Jody Wilson-Raybould, understood immediately the importance of this. And so by the spring of 2016, Ottawa had a formal role in the case. So because this enforcement mechanism for breaches of the act has significant fiscal implications for the provinces and territories, any discussion, as you might imagine, has significant impact on intergovernmental relations. And there's actually not a lot of political incentive to draw attention to these potentially sensitive conversations publicly. But we started 2016 with a uh, what they call FPT, Federal Provincial Territorial Health Ministers Meeting, 
And the biggest item on our agenda was negotiating the long-term funding agreement. The only thing that provinces wanted to talk about that year was how they needed more money. This feels like deja vu right now, but uh, how they needed more money in the transfer. And for several reasons, uh, that didn't seem to be the right time to play a heavy hand on clawbacks in the Canada Health Transfer. But what did start happening in March of that year in 2016 was some important private communications in the form of phone calls and letters to provincial ministers in which I let my concerns be known. And thankfully there were other forces at play. So Quebec had passed legislation in November of 2015 that would have entrenched user fees and essentially regulated their amount with a standard list for private payments. So in May of 2016, a Quebec lawyer by the name of Jean-Pierre Ménard announced a lawsuit against the federal government. Ménard was acting on behalf of a group called Réseau Fadoc, which was formerly called the Fédération de l'Âge d'Or du Québec. And it has about a half a million members. And the, uh, the argument was the lawsuit essentially was forcing me, the Minister of Health at the time, to comply with the Canada Health Act in Quebec and in other provinces. So I have to say it was a brilliant move and I quietly welcomed this pressure, particularly because this litigation brought evidence of the magnitude of the problem in Quebec. And it stated that extra billing and user fees for vaccinations, eye drops and other procedures had increased and was in the order of approximately 50 to $70 million per year in Quebec. And more helpful still, later that month, the Auditor General in Quebec tabled a report documenting the extent of user fees. And that Auditor General was reporting that Quebecers were facing add-on fees in the order of $400 uh, for a colonoscopy, an additional $225 million for a vasectomy, for example. And she estimated that the total was about $18 million per year. So this was exactly the kind of evidence that I needed. So you'll recall I said that if the federal minister believes that the information that a province or territory has provided is incomplete or inaccurate, he or she is expected to estimate any potential deduction but is required to consult with the province or territory before doing so. And so any kind of evidence on hand to support the magnitude of the problem was very beneficial. The federal government uh, was also, uh, well, was in this case, of course, facing litigation on the matter. And so I had no choice. I needed to write to the federal or to the provincial health minister and demonstrate that we took the matter seriously. And so in September 2016, I sent a letter to Quebec's health minister. It was Gaetan Barrett at the time and noted that the report of the Auditor General confirmed the presence of extra billing and user fees in Quebec. And I asked him to report about the costs that were being paid by Quebec patients and informed him that I intended to apply the act and retain a portion of the Canada Health Transfer. I also asked for an immediate end to the practice of extra billing and user fees. Um, and part of the reason I can tell you as much of the content of the letter is that somehow this letter became public. I don't know how, but Monsieur Menard, the lawyer, published a link to the letter on his website. So I must say, much to our delight, uh, there was a press conference in September of 2016 and Minister Barrett announced that he was abolishing accessory fees, les frais accessoires. He said that the decision illustrated the government's commitment to guaranteeing access in the healthcare system. And uh, Mr. Barrett, what Minister Barrett was asked uh, whether user fees weren't already illegal. Um, his answer was that if they were, the federal government would have intervened earlier. And when he was asked whether this had anything to do with the federal government or the Maynard lawsuit, he said it had nothing to do with either. It only had to do with fairness. So uh, at the time, the Quebec government estimated that the extent of user fees and extra billing was somewhere between 10 and $50 million a year. And so this, along with the Auditor General's report, really set us up nicely so that the next time when I had to decide how much penalty should be applied, uh, I had that information available to me. Okay, let's move west. 
Saskatchewan, meanwhile, was testing the waters on how to get around the Canada Health Act. They had something called the MRI Facilities Licensing Act that came into effect around the same time, February of 2016. And it was allowing uh, patients to have faster access to an MRI if they paid for the service. So the idea was that the private clinic performing the service could charge any amount for a privately performed or privately paid MRI. And in return, they had to provide an MRI to a publicly insured patient at no cost to either the patient or the provincial health insurance program. And uh, they later extended this one for one concept of private private payment uh, for publicly insured services to more diagnostic procedures such as CTs and ultrasounds uh, in what was called the Patient Choice Medical Imaging Act. So this raised considerable alarms, uh, cue jumping for these tests and the treatments that ensue were the most immediate concerns, but there were many others. So as you might imagine, to break even, private clinics would have to charge the private paying patient at least twice the amount that the clinic would normally be reimbursed for an MRI uh, covered by the provincial health insurance system. And patients then paying privately would be paying twice the public rate because otherwise any lesser rate um, would not serve as any kind of incentive for those private clinics to provide those uh, MRIs to private pay patients. And we really feared at the time that if these clinics were able to charge multiple times the public insurance rate, this would create pressure on clinic owners or the government to increase the amount that they should then be reimbursed by the public health insurance plan. Um, And I knew that there was no evidence that indicated that allowing some patients to buy or to pay for a diagnostic service reduces wait times. In fact, expediting access for some private pay patients who may not really need an MRI um, or may not really need that MRI more quickly than a publicly insured patient, that it was likely uh, that some kind of diagnostic imaging capacity was going to be consumed earlier and unnecessarily by private pay patients, which then makes publicly insured patients wait even longer for their test. Um, But more importantly, perhaps uh, permitting patient charges for diagnostic services contravenes the spirit and the letter of the Canada Health Act. And a patient who pays out of their own pocket for a diagnostic test going to the head of the queue, regardless of the urgency of their health need, uh, is problematic. If that test, as you imagine, reveals a need for further interventions, that patient may then proceed again more quickly to the front of the treatment line. So in both cases, the patients whose health needs might actually be more urgent are shunted back toward the back of the line. And this principle of universal access to care is undermined any time that the access is determined based on who's willing or able to pay rather than what the health need is. So I made my views on that well known uh, to two successive Saskatchewan health ministers. I made considerable effort to talk to them and encourage them to reverse their plans. I saw it as bad and costly policy and I hoped that we could find a dignified way for them to back down. As you might expect, the conversation about private pay MRIs then became entangled in our discussions around the health accord. And uh, Saskatchewan was insisting, understandably, that any compliance action of the federal government required by the Canada Health Act had to be consistent across all of the other provinces. And they were saying, how come you're not addressing user fee violations in Quebec? And why are you coming down so hard on us here in Saskatchewan? So when they signed the health agreement in January of 2017, they tried to to claim in the media, even though there was no evidence, that they had got a deal around MRIs. And I was reading these news articles that said, in a surprising move, the federal government has allowed Saskatchewan to continue violating the Canada Health Act for at least a year. I read those articles and I was livid. I made my communications team reach out to reporters and clarify the facts when any province was trying to to claim that we were not enforcing the act. So there was a nuance that Saskatchewan was trying to take advantage of, and that's that there's a lag time involved between when the user fees occur 
and when the province is obligated to report that a deduction uh, of, this, of the transfer occurs. So there were user fees that were occurring in 2015-16. They don't get reported until December of 2017. And those dollar for dollar deductions that the, of the transfer would be implemented at the end of that next fiscal year, the end um, in March of 2018. So Saskatchewan was using that lag time nuance to claim that they were getting a break and they wouldn't be penalized in the coming months for their private pay scheme. But that MRI private pay arrangement did and does violate the Canada Health Act. It allows people to jump the queue based on ability to pay and private pay imaging is in illegal and it's in inequitable. And we also now have uh, plenty of evidence that it doesn't improve wait times. It actually increases cost to the system. It introduces potential risks to patients because there's an incentive to conduct unnecessary tests. And so my bottom line in all that is that any scheme whose incentive structure encourages more unnecessary scans and puts upward pressure on the costs of the public system while simultaneously allowing people to jump the queue and do nothing to address wait times is truly terrible public policy. So amid all of that, we did manage to reach a health accord with Saskatchewan and we continued, committed that we would keep talking about our disagreement. I'm happy to say that the matter was picked up by my successor, uh, Minister Pettipot Taylor, and uh, the best outcome was that in August of 2018, she wrote to the provincial and territorial ministers to clarify a diagnostic services policy. She reaffirmed the longstanding federal position that all medically necessary physician and hospital services, including diagnostic services, must be covered by provincial territorial health plans, regardless of whether they're received in a public hospital or in a private clinic. She didn't accept the premise that because some patients are willing to pay for accelerated access, that they should be provided an avenue to do so. And through that letter, she confirmed that any charges to patients for medically necessary diagnostic services would be a contravention of the Canada Health Act. So that policy took effect uh, about a, just under a year ago. Uh, reporting on any patient charges for diagnostic services will begin in it's crazy lag time, it doesn't begin until December of next year for fiscal year 2021. Um, and that would mean that in accordance with the Canada Health Act, any transfers should or deductions of the transfer would have to happen in March of 2023. So something to watch out for. Anyway, let's, I've now totally sidetracked the talk uh, on the story of Saskatchewan. So let me take you back uh, to some, uh, to the end of 2016-17 and the decisions that had to be made then about Quebec and BC. So remember, March is the season right now. Uh, the federal health minister is determine, determining which automatic penalties have to apply. And I knew that there were references in several statements by M Monsieur Bernard to, Maynard uh, to the effect that he was keeping a close eye on what the federal government was going to do with regard to the Canada Health Act vis-a-vis -vis Quebec, but also more generally. And because of that letter that I had written to Monsieur Barrett, um, and because Quebec had announced the abolition of, of user fees, Monsieur ben Maynard agreed that he would put a hold on the proceedings of his action against the federal government. Uh, but in January of 2017, he issued a press release saying that the if the federal minister failed to apply the law as it pertained to Quebec, that he would begin the proceedings immediately. Uh, we were also, of course, at the time, really sensitive to the fact that Canada was party to the charter challenge in BC. And if the federal government didn't fulfill its obligation under the act, especially uh, with respect to penalties on jurisdictions that, that are allowing extra billings, billing and user charges, it would weaken the federal government's participation in that can be case, uh, but it would also weaken BC's own defense of its, its health insurance uh, regime. And we knew that those plaintiffs were also watching the federal action closely and looking for any inconsistencies. So here we are getting close to March of 2017 and I was determined to enforce the act and I didn't see it as optional. The act specifies automatic penalties and Maynard was expecting to see action. And we were defending the act in BC with the Canby case. So I 
believed our actions were critical. And even though previous governments had turned a blind eye, I believe that we were at a critical point in history where the publicly funded system was at risk and we had an, an obligation to protect it by upholding the act. So one of the big challenges and an excuse of many previous governments was that they didn't have enough evidence on which to enforce the penalties. And in the case of Quebec though, remember we had the report of the Auditor General and her estimate about extra billing and user fees with that range. Um, and even at the low end of the range, it was almost $10 million. So in March of 2017, I authorized a Canada Health transfer deduction of $9.9 .9 million. And it was a quiet but dramatic decision but what made it politically palatable was that the province had already acted to eliminate accessory fees and in the spirit of the acts intentionally non punitive objectives. Um, they knew that we would subsequently return that amount to Quebec, but in British Columbia we didn't have the same clarity. They did have audit evidence from 2012 that was in the public domain they had. There had been an audit of $174,000 of patient charges that had been um, done, had been executed during uh, one week at two clinics that were run by Dr. Brian Day. And this was widely known to be an, a significant underestimate of the total breaches um, because it was a very limited scope audit. So that was uh, still had been used as the basis for deductions in the transfer for a number of years from 2013 to 2016, there was this tiny transfer. But we have to note that um, when British Columbia used that figure, they did it in a non-extrapolated form. They were saying there's one week, $175,000. So British Columbia was reporting on a single week and didn't extrapolate it to the full amount. And we calculated that if they extrapolated it, it would add up to about $9 million. So as, a, as minister, I was required to make an estimate if I had reason to believe the report from a province was incomplete or inaccurate and extrapolating from that one week to a full year seemed like a reasonable way to make an estimate um, that would meet the test of the Canada Health Act. And I also knew that the $9 million didn't consider how many clinics uh, where it was widely presumed uh, that patient charges were occurring. We simply didn't have enough facts to uh, confirm the extent of the charges. We also should note that um, BC at that time, the transfer was in 2016-17 was, was uh, $4.7 billion. And so if we had taken a deduction of 9 million, it would have been 0.2% of their health transfer. But I can tell you at the political staff level, at the highest levels, everyone was very nervous about applying penalties both to BC and Quebec. I was adamant, I actually wrote to my chief of staff. I said, the prime minister's office should know the Canada Health Act was brought in under Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. It's the foundation of our publicly funded healthcare system. Uh, this is a quote, I said, this is a law and policy that liberals have always stood by. It's entirely in keeping with our commitment to supporting the middle class, upholding the Canada Health Act is good for Canadians. Some previous governments have gotten away with turning a blind eye because there hasn't been clear public documentation of violations to be addressed as we now have the evidence of violations in both BC and Quebec. And I wrote, if we do not act, we will almost certainly be sued again by Menard. We or I will look weak and cowardly. It will look like we only did the right thing under legal pressure. And the bottom line is that the Canada Health Act is the law. We have no choice but to do the right thing, end quote. So I can tell you there was a lot of hand wringing about what to do with BC in March of 2017. And in the end, we made the decision that we needed better data and that we would uh, we could make an estimate based on an extrapolation, but it would be even better if we had a more extensive audit. We believe that the federal government testified uh, when the federal government testified in the Canby case, it could do so from a position of greater strength if it were on the record as having made deductions that came as close as possible to the actual patient charges.
So fast forward, there was a provincial election in BC that summer, and then I was able to announce along with uh, Minister Dix in BC that three of the province's clinics were going to be examined for violations of the BC Medicare Protection Act, which is essentially the mirror of the Canada Health Act. And specifically, they would be examined for violations uh, for the use of user fees and extra billing in the case of medically necessary care. Now, unfortunately, those exact audit reports can only be released if the provincial minister deems it would be in the public interest to do so. But in March of 2018, the Federal Minister of Health authorized a deduction of $15.9 million from the Canada Health uh, Transfer to BC based on the results of those audits and extrapolating it to reflect province-wide charges. So setting aside that deduction reimbursement thing that I mentioned earlier that had taken pay place in Quebec, uh, this amount was by far the largest deduction that any province had ever had from the Canada Health Transfer since 1987. And uh, ongoing provincial audits of those private clinics uh, documented there were at least 11 clinics that were had been um, found to be extra billing in 2016-17. In and therefore, in March of 2019, another $16 million was deducted from the transfer to BC. So the Canada Health Act uh, has never been amended, but I am happy to say that work like this has allowed the kind of policy enhancements that have strongly benefited Canadians. You see, the goal of the enforcement of the Act is to make sure it's upheld. This is, again, one of its beauties. Um, the goal is to incent or encourage governments to come into compliance with the Act, not to inflict pain, uh, fiscal or otherwise, on provinces and territories, especially if they change their approach and comply, as was the case in Quebec. And so what we had needed was that um, approach that would clarify the policy, would allow us to deduct, but allow an ability for the provinces and territories to come into line with the Act. Uh, and that was similar kind of work that had happened actually in the mid 80s when the Act was first passed. So I have to credit again my successor, Minister Petty Pot Taylor, who uh, followed through on this in her August 2018 letter to the, the provincial health ministers. She announced a new reimbursement policy uh, that was such that provinces and territories could um, have their Canada Health Transfer deductions later reimbursed, but only if they had effectively or if they effectively address concerns related to extra billing and user charges, that is if they eliminate those extra charges. So provinces and territories are given two years after the deduction to be able to reverse those charges. Um, and uh, British Columbia has now submitted a reimbursement action plan, which is publicly available um, to des describe how they will uh, eliminate those charges. And as far as I know, they are continuing to work uh, with Health Canada on, on measures to curb patient charges. So I'm going to wrap up that behind the scenes, scenes commentary just to note that I think these experiences to me uh, in that relatively brief time that I was part of uh, that portfolio have demonstrated to me how the Canada Health Act and its mechanisms really can stand the test of time. It has provisions, including those enforcement mechanisms that, that really can withstand pretty substantial forces that are trying to erode universal accessible public health care in Canada. So let me just in, in closing, go back to the title of my talk, Do We Need the Canada Health Act? And you will have figured out my bias for sure. I am a big fan of the act. I think it is one of the key reasons why we have relatively good health outcomes in Canada using health systems that are comparatively uh, effective and efficient and equitable and accessible um, when you look at them from a global perspective. Now, what I haven't addressed in my talk is the possibility that we should actually raise the bar. Could we do better? Of course we could. Uh, you would be hard pressed, I think, and test it in this crowd, you'd be hard pressed to find, I think, a health policy expert in the country who thinks that the Canada Health Act has lived up to everything that it could have been. Uh, it certainly hasn't addressed all of the issues that its architects dreamed that it might. 
And I haven't got time to go into detail right now about exactly how I'd like to see it improved, although I'd be open to that in, in questions. Um, let me make just a few very brief comments. Um, there are lots of discussions around what are the missing pieces that are most essential to take on. And as you know, the strongest momentum has coalesced around the need for pharmacare. Um, I'm hugely supportive of this as an evidence-based expansion of Canada's legal framework for healthcare. Um, I've been disappointed, like probably some of you, on the slow progress in this file, especially at a time when the federal government is expressively supportive of it and federal ex federal spending has exploded in response to so many other needs. Um, I do have some anxieties about the type of pharmacare that will eventually be introduced and whether it will actually be universal single payer public pharmacare or whether it's going to be a, a patchwork fill in the gaps kind of approach. Um, I suggest the former, um, but that's a topic for another day. And permit me just to pitch three other missing pieces that I think um, there's good evidence that to build a case for expanding the Canada Health Act. In my dreams, if we were redesigning federal health legislation for the 21st century, um, in addition to improving our public health laws, which again is another topic for another day, but I think there are three care delivery components that should have a statutory obligation. And I would say those are universal comprehensive primary care, number two, mental health care, and number three, home care. Um, we know that the Act, even more so its predecessors, including the Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act of 57 and the Medical Care Act of 66, were written for a healthcare context that's very different from the modern day one. Uh, it was written in a context when care was delivered by by doctors and hospitals. And, and the biggest drivers of costs are still doctors and hospitals and medication adding up to about 60% of spending. Um, so why aren't we committed to publicly funding the less expensive uh, evidence-based means of improving health? Um, instead, we have put up with chronic underinvestment in primary care, mental health care, and home care, uh, which has made our system uh, inefficient and uh, has led to avoidable suffering. So my plea to those of you public policy students uh, would be to advocate for ways to bring those types of care in under the umbrella of statutory obligations for universal health coverage. Uh, and so uh, as uh, speaking to a, a group of policy experts like yourselves, I hope that you will continue your, your advocacy, uh, make your voices heard, make the scientific evidence heard, write opinion pieces as you see fit, collaborate, publish, stay active on social media, take, home of, take hold of whatever uh, platforms that you have to get uh, your views heard. Uh, the health of all Canadians really does depend on making sure that our health systems are accessible and fair. So you have all a role to play in that and uh, your work is essential as we continue to gather in the pursuit of health for all. And I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Dr. Philippa, for your insightful speech. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we're going to start the question and answer period now. So you can use the Q&A feature um, to ask your questions. We already have some great ones coming in. So the first one I'll get started with is, should long-term care be included as a service in the Canada Health Act? So, so that's an excellent question and uh, something that lots of people have been talking about over the last year. And I, I considered whether I would include that in my, my suggestions for how to expand or improve the act. Um, and you'll notice that I didn't suggest that. I suggested primary care, um, mental health care and home care, in part because I like to push us in the direction of home care. I think long-term care as it exists um, is not necessarily the ideal model of care for care of older people. Um, and I'll point to some of the work that folks at the School of Policy Studies have done to demonstrate that. Having said that, um, we absolutely need national standards for long-term care. And what the Canada Health Act has demonstrated is that there are really simple mechanisms for making that work by um, adding, using the federal spending powers to allow the federal government to exert some kind of policy pressure on the system, um, invest in, in long-term care and 
um, require that certain standards or, or criteria be upheld. My general thinking, and I must say I haven't delved into this to the extent that others have, would be to see a separate piece of legislation, a Canada Long-Term Care Act, uh, that could accompany that kind of investment. Um, I People are really nervous, as you know, about, you know, opening up the Canada Health Act and what else will happen to it. Um, and so I think probably possibly a more rapid approach would be a, a separate piece of legislation on long term care. Uh, so that would be my not entirely um, explored perspective as to how to go on that one. Thank you. Um, so another question is about bilateral agreements with the provinces and territories, um, such as for mental health and addiction services. And this person is saying that the agreements have weak performance measurement mechanisms. And so they're asking, how can the federal government improve the enforcement mechanism in these agreements? Okay, so that is a great question. And uh, per probably the person who asked it might have, uh, have great ideas. Um, so this came up when we negotiated that 20, uh, seven, 2016 Canada Health Accord um, and, and the, the transfers that took place. And, you know, all the provinces wanted was money. You know, it was, it's all about what the escalator is, whether it's 3% or whether it's higher. Um, and uh, nobody ever wants strings attached. I argue that the federal government, uh, in, again, using the, um, ability, the um, provisions of, of being able to use its spending power to dictate how the, it wants its money used, um, could make those kinds of investments, even without legislation, into specific areas where everyone agrees there's much more to be done and mental health and home care were the two big pieces. So you'll recall that when we came to that final agreement, we added $11 billion, um, six uh, billion for home care, 5 billion for, uh, for mental health care um, with the express um, uh, expectation that it should be used in that way to, by the provinces. Um, without having the legislative tool, it is really, really hard to be able to demonstrate. And so we spent a lot of time with those um, agreements and trying to negotiate the reporting mechanism that the provinces would have to do. It's still really tough, I have to say, to make sure that it doesn't just go to current practices and it's not used for in incremental provisions. Um, so I would say that there's still a lot of work to be done for the federal government to, to direct uh, money in those places without actually having the legislation to back it. Thanks. Um, so another question, um, and it's essentially asking about the motivations that provinces have to violate the act, why they would risk having to deal with those um, with federal government enforcement or um, I really interesting question. I mean, in part, um, it's do they really want to take on nobody wants to take on doctors, by the way, you know, people, doctors are a scary group, especially uh, when they when they get themselves together. And that was sort of the atmosphere in the 80s during that time when extra billing was going wild, um, was that, you know, doctors were threatening to go on strike, etc. Um, and, you know, they, especially when they gather in their um, various uh, medical associations can be a powerful force um, and can, and, and there will always be human incentives for wanting to, uh, to charge more, get paid more. And if the provinces don't feel that they're ever going to be called to account for this, then it's easier for the provinces essentially not to get messed up with trying to, to, to force, uh, um, force doctors to not do the extra billing and charge user fees. And it sometimes, of course, depends upon the uh, particular policy perspectives of, of whichever government happens to be in charge. And I actually think, you know, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I actually think not a lot of politicians are, are health policy experts. 
And it's not immediately self-evident why the accessibility piece of the Canada Health Act is so important. Uh, because, you know, there's lots of people that will make a very simplistic argument. There's people who have money to spend if they want to spend their extra $400 and get their colonoscopy faster or their hip or their knee or whatever faster. Why shouldn't we, you know, why shouldn't people be allowed to spend money to be able to get to the front of the line and it'll be done elsewhere. But the, most of them don't kind of think through the longer term implications of that and the, what it does to the rest of the wait list. And the fact that we've got finite resources in terms of the number of, of doctors in the system, uh, not to mention nurses and others in the system, and that every, every case that gets done outside of the public system is basically a drain of resources away from the public private system or public system. So uh, there are lots of incentives not to, to act. And so I think that's why it's so important for the federal government to say, we actually take this really seriously. This is the backbone of our system and uh, we are gonna pay attention and enforce the act. So the next question I'm gonna combine to, so someone is wondering about the role of the Canada Health Act at the intersection of race, racial justice and health equity. And another question is also asking about if the act can address Indigenous health disparities. Hmm, good questions. Um, in terms of links to uh, racial justice, um, I must say I have not kind of thought through what the implication, how the act might be able to be used in that regard, um, except where it becomes an accessibility piece and universality. So it, it's a very, very interesting question to try and think through if one can document um, that provinces and territories haven't provided fair and equal access uh, based on medical need and that there have been other barriers to care could that be seen as a violation of the act? Um, that's a good public policy question. I, I don't know whether you could argue that or not, but I would. it would be certainly worth a try. Um, in terms of Indigenous health, um, as probably most of the audience know, Indigenous, uh, it gets into some very complicated uh, jurisdictional issues, but, um, uh, the provision of, um, of medical care on reserve for First Nations is an obligation currently under of the federal government, unless it's in a circumstance where it's been negotiated otherwise, like in the case of the British Columbia First Nations Health Authority, uh, for example, and in other places where there are continued negotiations around uh, recognition of jurisdiction for uh, First Nations. Uh, Inuit also, uh, the federal government has an obligation to. So their uh, health care for people on reserve, First Nations on reserve and for Inuit are, are a little bit different. And um, so the act still pertains in terms of, of uh, care that's delivered under provincial jurisdiction. Um, can it be used to be able to improve things? I actually don't think that that's probably the lever that one needs to most affect. I would say recognition of Indigenous rights and sovereignty is probably a more powerful uh, mechanism that I would go after in terms of improving uh, Indigenous health outcomes. Thank you. Um, so a question um, that's very specific from Professor Lang asking, so saying it sounds like success on the Quebec enforcement case hinged on the evidence contained in the Quebec um, AG report. How can Ottawa improve its ability to get objective evidence from the provinces on compliance with the CHA without relying on episodic or ad hoc evidence from sources like a provincial AG? Um, good question. I think there are some I like to think there are some more simple mechanisms that the feds could do to be able to make it more possible. Um, I mean, if you get charged a user fee or uh, um, some kind of extra billing, um, most people don't really, lots of people don't realize that that's actually against the law, uh, not for the person who pays it, but for the person who, who or actually it's not against the law. It's, uh, it is, um, if the province allows that and doesn't scale, doesn't reimburse, then that's where the law is violated. Um, but most people, there's no mechanisms for reporting that are widely known. 
Um, I think some provinces have done a little bit of work at trying to let people know how they can report it, but I would argue that the federal government could potentially play a role by making Canadians more aware uh, of the fact that they shouldn't be charged extra for medically necessary care and here's how you report it and trying to find places where, where, um, where that could be reported more widely. That strikes me as sort of an, uh, an ombuds person or an ombuds person type website where people could, could um, uh, make those kinds of uh, pieces of evidence available uh, might be one mechanism. I think continuing to work with provinces that are supportive to, to do the kind of audits that have taken place recently in BC uh, might be another way that, that you, know, you can uh, offer to a province that you'll support paying for that audit or you'll share the costs of doing so. But that does require some collaboration with provinces and uh, might be hard. Uh, so one question uh, from the chat was very interesting, asking about um, basically the implications for the Canada Health Act if different governments from different parties um, have different attitudes towards it, how it can survive this polarization of, um, for example, liberal governments imposing deductions and then another government not choosing not to pursue that. Um, so I would say that over the years, um, you know, governments have, well, we've basically only ever had two stripes, particular stripes in at the federal level. Um, and, and um, you know, I think the, the turning a blind eye has happened from both liberal and conservative governments over the years. And it takes a lot of um, commitment to the act to actually be able to you know, move, address the forces against it. Um, you know, we're a conservative government to take place, to take uh, power federally in the future. Would this be a, one of their priorities? Um, possibly not. I think that's where I would just say to the audience, um, this is up to all of us, uh, especially those of you who are interested in health policy. This is a really important piece of legislation um, and we need to continue to put pressure um, health is something that everybody recognizes is important to Canadians, but, um, and politicians like to, to say that they're going to do something on it. They don't necessarily always do that much once they get into government, um, but we need to, to continue to put pressure on, on them all to, to act and, uh, and protect this legislation. Absolutely. Um, we are about to come to the top of the hour. Um, did you have any final comments before we wrap up or I know there's a lot of questions we couldn't get to, but. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm happy that over a hundred people care about this. That's, that makes me happy. And I hope you found this uh, somewhat interesting and helpful. And I kind of loved this work um, and it was really interesting to me. And I will say also just a really big shout out to the uh, public service. Um, there's a lot of people inside Health Canada that labor away at that Canada Health Act division. It is truly, I think one can say, a labor of love for them. Um, and they were super excited that they had a minister who um, wanted to help them support it because they had not been a division that had a lot of attention in the past. Uh, but they do really great work and uh, should be commended for trying to do everything that they can to, uh, to make sure that people have access to care. Uh, and there's some really smart health policy people in government too. So maybe uh, you, Hannah, and Maddie will one day be some of those people that will go in there and keep the act protected. Well, thank you so much um, for sharing your time with us today, Dr. Dil Dr. Philpot, and giving us so much to think about. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon. Okay. Thanks, everybody.